My name is Kyle Wingfield. I'm the president of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. Uh, I know we have a lot of people here who don't necessarily know about each of our uh, institutions here. So uh, Francisco Gonzalez is going to say a little bit in a moment about what National Review Institute does. Uh, but I'm going to do the same about the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. So we are a think tank based here in Atlanta. We work on state policy issues from a free market, limited government perspective, and we work on economic issues. So we do things like education and school choice, health care reform, transportation, taxes and regulation. We've also done a great deal on criminal justice reform. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that we work on. Uh, for those who are not familiar with us, uh, we are a totally privately funded nonprofit uh, nonpartisan organization if that's the kind of thing you'd like to support there's a way for you to indicate that or you can sign up for the Friday facts that way as well um, so those are our announcements and it's my pleasure now to introduce Francisco Gonzalez to tell us a little bit about National Review Institute Thank you all for being here, and um, it's a pleasure to work with uh, the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. Um, I actually just uh, a few weeks ago spent a little time with Kyle. We were in D.C. for a program at American Enterprise Institute put together. But uh, I previously to my work at NRI had actually worked at a sister think tank uh, down in Florida, the James Madison Institute. So I'm very familiar with the importance, um, and I think David might speak to this sometimes too, uh, the importance of what's going on at the state level, because we sort of fight a lot in Washington, D.C., but it's really everything happens in the states, and you guys just saw that uh, with, you know, some of the recent legislation here. So uh, that happens, and those sorts of things happen because of state think tanks like the Georgia Public Policy Foundation, and uh, I've known Benita Dodd for, for many years now, and uh, one of my favorite people on Facebook. Facebook. Uh, she just gives me a laugh almost every day, um, and it's only because every day I have to check that, that, that page. So she's hilarious. But uh, thank you all for uh, being here. National Review Institute, if you're not familiar, you may be familiar with National Review Magazine, which was founded by William F. Buckley Jr. back in 1955. Uh, well, National Review Institute was founded in 91 with the idea as a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Uh, the magazine is for profit, or as Rich Lowry likes to call it, it's the no profit uh, part of the enterprise. Uh, but you know, pr print journalism has been dying for many years. So, one of the ways that they foresaw many years ago on how to continue the mission of National Review is to do it through an institute. And so, we, one of our major things that we do is support the major talent at National Review uh, to keep and, and secure that talent there. Uh, we have 12 of the main writers of National Review are fellows with the Institute. And one of those people you're going to hear from today, David French. Uh, you're probably familiar with people like Victor Davis Hanson and Jonah Goldberg and Catherine Lopez, Ramesh Panuru and Andy McCarthy. So just a great, really great collection of talent that we get out there. We, we partner with many state think tanks across the country and other organizations. We also bring uh, these writers and speakers to college campuses and uh, have some programs for young professionals, mid-career professionals, do their NRI regional fellowship program. So a lot of different ways we're trying to just get out there off the pages of National Review. And uh, a couple of the, the big events we do, we do a big uh, annual prize dinner every year where we move it around the country. This November will be in Palm Beach at the Breakers. Uh, prize is going to Rush Limbaugh and Gay Gaines, who's a major philanthropist down in South Florida. And um, so come and join us. If you, there are, we have uh, materials that can tell you a little bit more out on the front table. Uh, feel free to take our newsletter. All that information's on there. And also, um, one of the things that, that, that happens under the National Review uh, uh, sort of family is we, for many, many years, National Review has done uh, cruises. Uh, and that's done under the, the magazine side of the organization. Uh, but we have, uh, the, the, we actually partner with uh, the, cru uh, the Cruise Vacation Authority, uh, which is actually based right here in the Atlanta area. We have two representatives here, Myla and Howard. They're back here in the, in the far left. Uh, um, or far right from your perspective. Um, and so uh, they, uh, please talk to them if you're interested in National Review Cruise. I know uh, uh, Gene and Marion uh, have gone on many cruises. You're going on the one this year, right? Maybe? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, the one this year is actually going uh, in, uh, at a, from Montreal all the way around Prince Edward Island, 
uh, Maine, Boston. It's a beautiful cruise at the end of August. So if you want to get out of this Atlantic heat, great time. David will be on the cruise. Uh, and so basically a lot of these cruises have a lot of great uh, National Review uh, writers where you can interact with them over dinner, but also hear them in forums and conferences. So anyway, um, we are very happy to be here in Atlanta and partnering with the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. Thank you guys. And I'll turn it back over now uh, to Kyle to introduce David. to get to David as quickly as possible. You have his full bio on the programs on your table, but I will just take a moment to say as a former journalist myself that uh, I'm kind of picky when it comes to which writers I really like to, to follow. And David for uh, several years now has just been a must read for me. Uh, I, I love, uh, first of all, he's extremely prolific on any given day. He's probably written four or five things, it seems like. Um, and, and the range of topics that he covers is, is extraordinary as well. Uh, but I, I admire his clarity and I admire his fearlessness. And I think uh, he is just a great example of sticking to your principles and writing in a way that is respectful of others and, uh, and just a model that a lot of young writers out there and older ones uh, should follow. So with that, I will bring you David French. So um, I'm, gonna be, I'm talking about free speech today and a topic that an awful lot of people want to discuss. And I'm going to begin with an assertion that I think is going to be counterintuitive to a lot of you guys. And here's the assertion. Right now in the United States of America, you are more free to speak, free from government interference than in any time in the entire history of the country. The protections given to you, protections from government interference with your speech, are greater and more robust than ever before. Uh, in large part because of a long campaign of litigation against things like college speech codes. I have a former colleague here, Travis Barron, who just argued a case in the 11th Circuit against a Georgia university that was censoring students. Uh, time after time, litigation has been successful in front of Obama appointees, in front of Trump appointees, in front of Bush appointees, in front of Clinton appointees. Just win after win after win. So in one sense, you could look at America right now, and you could see, you could say that this is a great time for per individual liberty. This is a great time for freedom. But here's the thing. I go around the country, all over the country, and I ask this question, do you feel more free to speak now on hot button social issues or political issues than you did 10 years ago? And nobody says yes, nobody. I mean, not even like the troll in the back of the room is like <laughs> raising their hand and saying, I feel totally free to just say whatever I want to say on Facebook, Twitter or whatever, free from any repercussions. No, we live in an environment of pervasive, actual pervasive fear about your ability to share your deepest beliefs. I was in my um, Sunday school class not long ago in Franklin, Tennessee. Now, you know, I know Atlanta has a big evangelical population, uh, but let's be honest, Nashville, it's not the belt buckle of the Bible Belt, it's the Jerusalem. Okay, you've, got, you've got the Southern Baptist Convention there, you've got the Christian publishing industry, the Christian music industry, and then everyone who works uh, for industrial Christianity in Nashville lives in Franklin. Okay, they commute. And so a guy is sitting there in Sunday school in Jerusalem saying, I'm afraid to share my faith on social media because I'm afraid of what my employer will do. This is a guy working in Nashville, Tennessee, afraid to share his deepest beliefs on social media because he's afraid of his employer. And that's the key point. What is happening now is we have won the legal battle for free speech and we are losing the culture of free speech. We are losing a culture that respects or values debate or disagreement in favor of mobbing and shaming and firing and destroying. And I can go through example after example after example. You know, you've heard all of them. 
I mean, right now, today, the Texas legislature is considering a bill to protect Chick-fil-A. And now, this bill, by the way, is not a bill to give Christians special rights. It's a bill to protect people from unlawful viewpoint discrimination. And guess what? There's already talk generating again of, you've heard it here in Georgia, right? Corporate boycotts, corporate shame campaigns, online mobbing, online shaming as a substitute for real and actual debate. Um, if you talk to people who do a lot of work on the free speech space in colleges, you're going to hear them say something like this. Before, say, 2014 or 2015, our battle was against the administration. They were implementing crazy, nonsensical policies and then using those policies to suppress free speech. And we had to fight the administration. How crazy were some of these policies? Let me tell you. Here's one. An actual policy I sued to overturn with the help of Travis um, at several years ago in Pennsylvania. Here was the policy. Don't think too hard about this or it will tear a hole in the space-time continuum. Okay. Acts of intolerance will not be tolerated. Okay, let's think about it just for a second. Let's open, the, open a crack. So if I commit an act of intolerance that's not tolerated, which is an act of intolerance which is not tolerated, and it's like, you, you, you know what it's like when you have two mirrors facing each other? Infinite images, infinite intolerance under that policy. So these things were, it was challenging to find plaintiffs, it was challenging to find people bold enough to challenge their own university. Ruth Malhotra in this audience is the one person who's bold enough to challenge her own university. But once we challenged them, we could win. But around 2014, 2015, things began to shift. Instead of top-down censorship, we saw grassroots censorship. We saw students demanding silence. We saw students demanding conformity. You saw actual violence in Berkeley, actual violence in Claremont. You saw actual violence in Los Angeles. You saw violence in Middlebury College. You saw vi threats of violence in Missouri, the University of Missouri. I mean, the grassroots actually touched the third rail in Missouri. They messed with SEC football. <laughs> they threatened a boycott of the SEC football game. Now Missouri's been suffering as a result of that decision for years, rightfully so. But you saw this grassroots groundswell, this desire to intimidate, this desire to silence. And right now people are reeling from it, including people on the left, in the center left. I just was at an event not long ago and a very, very senior, very connected, very powerful progressive said, I am terrified of my students. I'm scared of my own students. I cannot, I feel like I cannot introduce new ideas. I cannot challenge them. I cannot in any way provoke them or my career is over. And this is a, a progressive. And that is far from an isolated sentiment. So I want to talk about how did we get here and what can we do about this. So I have a little bit of insight on how we got here because I feel like I was present at the creation of this movement. Um, my background is I grew up in, I was born in Opelika, Alabama. My parents were Auburn students. Moved to Baton Rouge where my dad taught at LSU. Was raised about 20 miles from the University of Kentucky. And then now my two oldest kids are going to the University of Tennessee. So if anybody has SEC street cred in this room, it is me. But so I'm a, I'm a son of the South. I grew up in the South. I went to a small private Christian college in Nashville, Lipscomb University. Some of you have probably heard of it. We, we took on Texas in the NIT finals. It was our greatest moment in the institution's history. Um, so I grew up in, a sm in small towns. I uh, went to a small Christian college. And then I was admitted by miracle of miracles under the redneck affirmative action plan <laughs> into Harvard Law School and entered into a completely different world. I've got a couple of friends here who were there at this time. And this was the time of the boo, of the hiss, of the shout down. This was not something that had spread widely throughout America, but in elite higher education, in elite quarters of higher education, we were beginning to have see this idea that it was a moral imperative not just to rebut or debate people, but to deplatform them, to silence them, to shame them. 
And so this was turned on me and some of my friends with a vengeance. One of my favorite stories is uh, right at the beginning of my law school career, I formed a pro-life legal organization with a few other friends. We called it the Society for Law, Life, and Religion, which we thought was a really distinguished sounding name, but then it turned into an acronym and it was pronounced slur for the next like 25 years it existed at the law school. Uh, we formed a pro-life club and one of the first things that we did is we, we wrote a letter to the student body that outlined the fact that Harvard required you to pay a health services fee and part of that health services fee would pay for elective abortions. But if you had a conscientious objection to this policy, you could write to school and get that a refund of that portion of your fee that paid for abortions. So it was a very small refund, but it's an important principle. And I thought, we need to tell, this is sort of a tradition that pro-life students did, we need to tell the student body about this policy. So I wrote a letter, it was very nice. How do I know it was nice? My, my friends made me make it even nicer, like I had to revise it to niceness scale, you know, the, a 10 on the niceness scale. I distribute it by hand to everyone, and I, but I made a mistake. I, I put a sheet of paper in the bottom and it said, if you want to take advantage of this policy, fill out this form and return it to David French, 1L, and I told exactly how to reach me. And I just distribute this thing, and I, I go back to my, my dorm room, do my studying for the evening, go to class the next day, in the afternoon I go to my mailbox, and this is before um, I had had all of the idealism in life just crushed out of me. <laughs> and I'd look at the mailbox, and it's stuffed with paper, just stuffed with paper. And I think for one fleeting half second, <laughs> I have tapped into the late pro-life movement at Harvard Law School. Then I opened the first piece of paper, and it says, why don't you go die, you effing fascist? Next one, you're a fascist. And it went on in that theme again and again. It's almost like they put out talking points. It was, call him a fascist, wish for his death, use profanity in any combination of points one and two. Now, I want to be really clear. I don't want to be uh, too dramatic about this. These were not death threats. They were death aspirations. <laughs> I'm not going to kill you. I just hope somebody or something does. That was a shocker to me. I went to law school, and I... I was intimidated out of my mind, guys. I read apologetics books before I went, expecting to you know, engage people in high-level discourse about the origins and veracity of the Christian faith. I read philosophy books before I went. I was expecting to engage in high-level conversation with some of the smartest people in America. And that did happen some. But it would also happen that I would speak in class, and I would hear, instead of a reasoned argument back at me, <sighs> just people screaming and yelling and trying to shout you down. And so what happened is these people educated at these elite institutions who were convinced that what I believed wasn't just wrong but malicious, not just wrong but malicious, that people like me, our voice in public debate, we had no voice, and in fact our voices were harmful. And this idea leaks into the wider culture leaks across higher education, leaks across elite private education, to the point where it is now in many ways received conventional wisdom that essentially everyone who disagrees with you on a, if you're on the cultural left, everyone who disagrees with you on a hot button cultural topic is literally the moral equivalent of the Klan. Literally the moral equivalent of the Klan. And who wants to hear from the Klan? I mean, I've had this argument a million times on college campuses, a Christian student group is thrown off campus because they have the audacity to say, we would like to be led by Christian <coughs> leaders. I mean, doesn't the Democratic Party want to be led by a Democrat, right? Doesn't the Republican Party want to be led by a Republican? You don't have the Sierra Club being led by a guy driving a Toyota Tundra. <laughs> or maybe you do. They can, they're kind of flexible on that. Um, but... Don't you want a group to be led by a person of like mind? Of course you do. And how many times have I had this argument? How many times where they say, look at a Christian fellowship. In one case, this is my favorite. The InterVarsity Multi-Ethnic Christian Fellowship at Rutgers University was thrown off campus for violating the diversity policy. It was one of the only majority-minority multi-ethnic groups on the whole campus, and it was thrown off campus and one of the arguments I have about this majority-minority religious student group 
is, well, if we let them on campus, don't we have to let the Klan on campus? Like, there's no daylight between them. No daylight. And we had this argument time and time again. And I remember in the early 2000s, I would go and I would speak to rooms like this. And I would tell people these arguments are happening. That, like, the local Baptist church is being um, uh, compared to, I don't know what they call a Klan group, but being compared to a Klan group. Clavern, yes. Um, and, and so, and people would look at me incredulous. What are you talking about? You're kind of a little hysterical and alarmist, aren't you? Uh, that's not going to happen. And now I talk about these comparisons and everyone's like, yep, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. And so we've reached a position that is completely different from the classic defense of free speech in this country. The classic defense of free speech in this country is based on uh, the ideas in large part of John Stuart Mill. And he sort of begins with a free speech argument that's a position of humility. It begins with this statement that I don't think would be controversial to anyone in the room. I'm not omniscient, okay? I don't know everything. So what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that if I don't know something or if I'm mistaken about something and I'm exposed to a contrary point of view and I'm persuaded by reason and logic to go from error into truth, free speech has been good for me. It has improved me as a human being. And so somebody goes, well, yeah, that's... All fine and dandy if you're wrong, but I'm not wrong. So what does free speech do for me? And John Stuart Mill says it does this. Even if you engage with somebody and you have an argument and you have a disagreement and you have a debate and not only are you not convinced of your position, you're more hardened and firm in your position, free speech has benefited you because it's edu educated you about the other side and has sharpened your own thinking and your own ability to present your ideas. How many of us have had that experience? Engage with somebody smart on the other side, and I guarantee you the next time you talk about your ideas, you're better at it because your weaknesses and weak points have been tested. But now that understanding of, of essential humility is gone. And not only is it gone, it is retreating at an ever faster rate. Why is that? There's a very human reason why that is so. And that very human reason is right now Americans of different perspectives are less likely to live and work around people who disagree with them than virtually any time since we've been measuring this statistic. There's this concept called the big sort. And now a large majority of Americans have been sorted themselves into ideological enclaves such that a majority of Americans now live in communities <coughs> where more than, that go for one candidate or another by more than 20%. Uh, and this big sort is especially pronounced in our intellectual centers. This is a true statement. This is absolutely true. The <coughs> island of Manhattan is less ideologically diverse than your average suburban megachurch. The island of Manhattan is less ideologically diverse than a suburban church. Wow. So white evangelical Protestants very famously voted for Donald Trump with 81% of the vote. Biggest percentage of the white evangelical Protestant vote for any candidate ever since we've been measuring this. 90% of the residents of Manhattan voted for Hillary Clinton. And it's not just Manhattan. Brooklyn, very similar numbers. Queens, very similar numbers. Washington, D.C., similar numbers. Philadelphia, similar numbers. San Francisco, similar numbers. L.A., similar numbers. Huge urban center after huge urban center. Nine out of ten people, are they might disagree on Medicare for All, or they might disagree on free college, or they might disagree on this or that point of, you know, uh, 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 of different foreign policies, but they are fundamentally on the same side politically. And here's what happens when you're around a whole bunch of like-minded people all the time. And if you remember nothing at all about this speech, remember this concept. It is called the law of group polarization. Okay, what is the law of group polarization? It is very simply this. When people of like mind gather, the common expression of their shared view becomes more extreme. Okay, super simple. If Let's say we're all having a conversation just now about the Second Amendment, and we're all strong supporters of the Second Amendment. Are we going to end that conversa conversation? proclaiming our love for, quote, common sense gun control, or are we going to be racing each other to the gun store to get another AR-15? And I emphasize another AR-15 because every self-respecting member of the Second Amendment community already has one. 
Um, no, when common people gather with a common purpose, they get more extreme. How many times have you left a Bible study going, I love Jesus less? You are usually, when you gather at church and you are around people of like mind to encourage you, you're going to, it renews your zeal, it renews your fervor. And this is the case, it's just a human condition. It's a human condition. So when common people gather and have like mind, they get more extreme. And here's the crazy thing about it. If you deliberate together long enough, you become more extreme than the most extreme member of the group at the start of the deliberation. Now, there are very many examples of this coming into play. Here's one. How quickly did we go from the idea that a man could be pregnant was bizarre to the point where if you disagree, you can be thrown off social media and lose your job? Like, like that. Like that, so fast. Think about Medicare for All. It was not very long ago that Bernie Sanders was the only sponsor of a Medicare for All bill. He wasn't even a Democrat. He was this cranky socialist from Vermont. Nobody wanted to touch it. Nobody. Now it's a litmus test in the Democratic primary, and Joe Biden is public enemy number one for the left because he won't embrace it which is the only thing he won't embrace. <laughs> so this is moving rapidly in a particular direction, very rapidly. And I could come up with examples on the right as well. So what we're doing is we're sprinting away from each other, believing we have nothing to teach each other, and we're increasing in what is called negative polarization. And negative polarization is this. It says, I am on my side not because I believe in my side's ideas, but because I dislike the other side. Unless we think this is a new thing, that this is a Trump thing, it's not a Trump thing. It's not a new thing. It's been a long, simmering change. Let me share some 2014 numbers with you. This is 2014, height of hope and change, right? There's no red America. There's no blue America. There's just... United States of America, that was the, the Obama rhetoric that shot him to the, you know, into the presidency. 2014, if you interviewed the average Republican and said, what do you think of your average, all you know about the other person is they're a Democrat. 82% of Republicans said, I either strongly or somewhat dislike that person. If all I know is they're a Democrat, either strongly or 82% of Republicans strongly or somewhat dislike a Democrat. Now the Democrats, as befitting their reputation, extremely more tolerant than Republicans. Only 78% of them either strongly or somewhat dislike a Republican. Those numbers have gone up considerably, by the way, in the last five years. Right now, people are more likely to want to see a son or daughter marry a person of a different faith than a person of a different political party. So eternal damnation is preferable to an alliance with a Democrat. So this is where we are. Other polls have shown that upwards of 60, 70, 80 million Americans believe that their, your political opponents have subhuman characteristics. Similar percentages believe that the country would be better off if a large chunk of the political opposition just died. Just died. Now, that's your death aspiration writ large. Not just focused on one person, but focused on a bunch of people. That our country would be better off if a bunch of our political opponents just died. That's where we are. So in that circumstance, it is incredibly difficult to create an atmosphere that says, yeah, I'd be fine if you died, but I'm going to protect your right of free speech until you croak. No, that's not the culture that we're in. So the question is, I'm going to say humbly, what can we do to, kick, to, to swim against this tide? And then I'll open it up for questions. What can we do to swim against this tide? And I'm going to say it's hard. I'm going to say it's hard because it's a cultural struggle. It's not a political struggle. I cannot say vote for candidate X. He has a five-point plan to change American culture. You can't do that. There is no such thing as a political plan to change American culture. On free speech, politics has actually delivered. We have legal protections, protections for free speech. So what's the cultural solution? What's the cultural solution? I put in here that there's a courage answer to political correctness. 
And what I mean by that is, we cannot allow ourselves to be intimidated into silence. Because what happens is silence becomes self-reinforcing and creates an artificial perception of unanimity. So if you're in a, let's say you're in a predominantly left-wing corporation, there might be more Republicans than almost anyone knows there. But if no Republican says anything, then the other side will feel as if it is in a dominant position and will press and press and press its advantage. I have been in rooms where raising your hand and being the lone dissenter can shift the entire momentum of the moment. The entire momentum. I'll give you an example. I used to teach at Cornell Law School. I think at the time I was the only conservative on the whole faculty. And they put me on the uh, admissions committee, which is really like letting the fox into the hen house. So I saw how the sausage, sausage was made. If you, anyone wants to know how to get into an Ivy League school, I'm available for consultation afterwards. <laughs> Does not involve bribing crew coaches in any way, shape, or form. But I remember we had this candidate, and the admissions committee only took the hard cases. There were people who were clear admits because their credentials were stratospheric, and there were people who were clear rejects because their credentials were not good. So we only, all we only looked at the, at the marginal cases. But in this case, we had a guy. He was valedictorian of his undergrad. He had a perfect record at a ma in his master's. He was a marvelous writer. He had glowing recommendations. And he worked for a presidential campaign. And we were looking at him as a marginal case. I'm thinking, why? why? Then I took a closer look. He went to a Christian college. He went to a seminary. And the presidential campaign he worked on was Dan Quayle's short-lived presidential. <laughs> Many people forget Dan Quayle did run for president. Um, and so I realized, oh, this is just a pure ideological religious act of discrimination. Then I flipped over to the handwritten comments, and they actually said it. They said, there, he, we don't need God squatting like this at this school. We don't need Bible thumping like this at this school. And I was appalled, and I'm at the, at the table with all of my colleagues, not all, you know, the colleagues on the committee, and I, I said, y'all, my, my background makes this guy look like a pagan. And I'm on this committee, and this looks a lot like to me, it looks a lot to me like religious discrimination. And I waited for the backlash. Like, I waited for them to turn on me, and instead what I got was a series of profuse apologies. And they said, oh, yeah. You're right. Now, some members of the committee would have rejected him anyway. They kept silent. They were still angry about the guy. But a majority of the committee immediately granted him admission. And here's a funny coda to that story. A few years later, I'm looking at incoming resumes when I was working for the Alliance Defending Freedom. And what did I come across but a graduate of Cornell Law School with honors who had come, gone to a Christian college, graduated with a perfect seminary, uh, with a seminary degree, Graduated with honors from Cornell Law School and worked for Dan Quayle, and I thought, I know you. <laughs> and he ended up working at ADF. So, um, so that was just one small example. But what I what I urge people, we live in a we live in a world right now where I fear that conservatives are angry. Conservatives are confronting a temptation, and that temptation is either to be quiet or to just let it all hang out and own the libs, trigger the libs, melt the snowflakes, right? Someone asked me last night when I had dinner when I was talking about this, they said, well, can we at least rent the libs? <laughs> if you're saying you don't own the libs, I want to lease a lib. Um, we're like, just let it all hang on. Be angry, be mad, or be silent. But the opposite of political correctness is not acting like a jerk. The opposite of political correctness is doing the, hearing what a liberal says and saying the opposite. That's still letting them set the agenda. The opposite of political correctness, in my view, is speaking the truth with grace and humility and fearlessness. And so what I think and what, I, what we have to build as a cultural response to unreason, we have to respond with reason. We have to be fearless about it, but there is such a thing as being fearlessly reasonable. Share the best expression of your side's point of view. Not the most triggering expression. Share the most reasonable speech. Because here's the thing that happens. When you engage in reasonable speech and the world comes against you, you are easy to defend. You are easy to defend. You will have a ton of allies that will come around you. 
When you engage in unreasonable speech, an awful lot of people are going to shy away. Why? Because they don't want to be associated. Because it's risky for them to be associated with you. So it, the defense of liberty is a fearless expression of reason and thought. And it also involves another thing. It involves being consistent. I have uh, this thing that I call the legal corollary to the golden rule, which is defend the rights of others that you would like to exercise yourself. If you see someone who's being censored that you disagree with, stand up for them. Do it. You're not going to win over the unpersuadables, but you, what, what you're going to do is you're going to build respect amongst those people who are persuadable. And believe me, they exist. Like that professor who came to me and said, I'm afraid of my own students. He's a guy who is beginning to learn of the problem of the loss of the culture of free speech and wants to do something about it and is looking for allies. And there's this one last thing. And then we'll have some questions. The last thing is, do your best to be unoffendable. Do your best to be unoffendable. Be a walking safe space for speech. That's what I try to do, is I try to have an environment where the zone around me, you can say, if it's the battle of ideas, you can say whatever you want to say, and I'm going to engage. And in that sense, it's trying to model the values you would like to see upheld in our, in our country. So defend the rights of others that you would like to exercise for yourself. Be unoffendable to as much as, as possible and to speak your deepest values fearlessly and reasonably. And you're going to stand out in this culture and you're going to begin to swim against a terribly strong tide. And we're beginning to see people do this and, we're be and you will find that you will have allies you never thought that you would have. They're out there. And that's, I think, only way we're going to stop this tide that is ripping us to shreds. All right, thank you, and let's have some questions. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, David. To what extent has social media and the technology of social media served as an accelerant to what you're talking about? Um, Social media puts human nature on blast. Uh, essentially what it does is it did not make people bad, but it helps spread the word and the, spread the, it helps spread the message of a lot of bad people virally. And one of the things though I think that we, we forget about social media is the people who are very online, is a, that's a small percentage of the American population who are very online, but they have a disproportionate impact in the real world. And the reason is, a, it, the reason is as old as the hills. It's as old as the high school cafeteria. It's peer pressure. It's peer pressure. So almost every time you see someone fired from a job, it is not because, or silenced, it's not because millions of Americans raise their voice in protest. It's because hundreds of Americans communicated to like-minded ideologues in that, in to, in that company and said, if you want to be still part of our club, that guy's got to go. It's high school cafeteria, peer-to-peer -peer relationships that are being spread on social media. We're seeing right now books pulled from young adult Twitter. I mean, young adult fiction. Young adult fiction is a, is a genre of fiction that has millions and millions and millions of readers. But publishers are pulling books that are deemed not politically correct enough because of dozens and dozens of tweets. And why? Because they, the people who are tweeting at them are people whose opinion they value and they want to be in that club. And so what social media has done, it has connected like-minded peer groups and created peer rules to maintain presence in that group and enforce them ruthlessly. Ruthlessly. So a lot of these boycotts you, boycotts you hear about, are millions of people boycotting? No. Is there a measurable impact on anybody's business? No. But do Disney execs want to be well thought of by their millennial staff? Yes. When you hear about people like uh, being terminated from major publications, a lot of that is not because hundreds and hundreds and thousands of subscribers have done anything. It's because the staff that says, I don't want to work with this person. That's why. So social media is creating and connecting very intense peer groups and it's deceiving the participants into believing they're more popular than they are, that their ideas have more currency than they do. And I'll give you an example that playing out right in front of us. The Democrats saw a poll from the New York Times recently that said 
People who are frequently on social media who are Democrats are outnumbered by people who are not on social media two to one. And the people not frequently on social media are majority, conservative to moderate. And that the Democratic electorate, which everyone thought was far, 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 far left, is actually majority not, does not identify as progressive by a majority. And so all of a sudden, all of a sudden Joe Biden comes in and he doesn't have much of a platform except it's like, I'm Uncle Joe, I just finished washing my Trans Am and here I am. Let's hug it out, America. And, and he's like blowing the top off the poles to an extent that you know hardly anyone expected. In South Carolina, 58% of black voters want to vote for Joe Biden, 58%. Kamala Harris doesn't even get 10 or 11 percent. The flavor of the month, month, Pete Buttigieg, guess what his percentage is? Zero percent of, of black voters. So right as of right now, Pete Buttigieg belongs in that old book, Stuff White People Like. Um, and so there is hope that enough people will start to realize that this social media world is an isolated, small world full of angry extremists. But until we realize that, until those peer groups realize that, it's just going to get more toxic. Yes, in the back. Um, I have a legal strategy question. Is this one? Yeah, I'll, and I'll repeat back okay. the question. So um, I'm an attorney at ADF on the life team, and a surprising number of our life cases are actually coming down to speech. Mm -hmm. um, including the one we wanted the Supreme Court last year. And um, so when it's the government doing it, I feel we feel great about our cases, right? Like you said, yeah. the law is super solid um, in free speech right now. But we're starting to see it a lot more with Facebook, Google, Amazon, those sorts of things, especially Facebook. Uh, Google just released a policy a few days ago where for pregnancy centers, if they run a Google ad, Google is going to insert, does not provide abortions right. into their ad. And if you are at an abortion clinic, they just sort of advertise for you and say, perform abortions. And we, I would love to do something. I mean, what do you think is a way to go about pushing back against that? Because it's not right. Yeah, it is not right. And there's, number one, here's what I do not believe should happen. I do not believe in government interference in breaking up Google, regulating the speech that Google promotes or does not promote. Google's a private entity. It enjoys uh, free speech rights just like every other private entity. But that doesn't mean we leave the issue alone. And another reason why, you know, I hear a lot of Republicans now say, break up Google, break up Google, break up Facebook. Look, guys, we've already lost the battle with Google and Facebook in a, in a very important way. These companies are staffed, chock full of some of the wokest people you're ever going to meet in your entire life. I mean, you're talking about 98, 99% of political donations go to Democrats, extremely uh, a, a culture, now there are conservatives and Republicans in there, but the culture is very, very left. If you have one big woke Google and you break it into nine Googles, what are you going to have? Nine woke Googles. I'm not quite sure that's better, okay? Um, but here's, I think there's three things that we can do. One is do not neglect the power of persuasion. I know for a fact people have engaged with Silicon Valley executives and changed their minds about important things. This happens. Do not assume that your opposition is acting in bad faith and that your opposition is not open to contrary ideas. Never make that assumption. So number one, engage to persuade. Number two, we need to encourage entrepreneurial energy and market corrections. If we believe in the free market, we need to think about, and as conservatives, explore whether there are alternatives that meet the same kind of need. And we need to not assume that these giants are always going to be giants. Uh, four years ago, hardly anyone had heard of Snapchat. Now it's gigantic. Um, Twitter, its daily active users, is flatlining and sometimes even declining. So, and less political places like Instagram are surging. And so, the market has some power here, and we need to encourage market competition, including encouraging conservative entrepreneurs. And then the last thing is, I think we need to encourage our best and brightest young people to pursue careers in the world of commerce, perhaps more than we have. Um, for a long time, when I was growing up in the conservative movement, I would go and I would speak to Christian attorneys, for example or law students, and I would ask, how many of you guys want to do what I do? Religious liberty lawyer, write for National Review, and every hand would go up, like every hand. And I'm thinking, 
two things at once. One, I don't need that competition. <laughs> there's, there's only so many slots here, and I don't want to fight all the time for my slot. Number two, where do you have more influence? Is it chief legal counsel for Senate Judiciary, or is it um, in general counsel's office in Facebook? More influence on the culture. Is it even, maybe, is it as a congressman? It's a high-level position. Or is it a board member of Facebook? When you start to think about the incredible cultural power that our commercial institutions have, we need to encourage many of our best and brightest to not look at their time in private enterprise as the duty that they undertake to give them experience to say, I'm a businessman before they get into politics, but to be as committed to their mission within a corporation as the progressive left is, as committed to their mission in a corporation, and every bit is aware of the impact of corporate culture on American, larger American culture as everybody else. So, number one, encourage market competition. Number two, uh, I forgot number two, no, number two is, um, is uh, um, I did forget number two. Number one, encourage market competition. <laughs> Uh, number, number three, encourage uh, st students to um, engage in commerce rather than free enterprise. And, you know, I think the, the, the reality is um, we continue in the conservative movement to think about government too much, ironically. Ironically. Paul Weyrich, who was a, um, one of the founders of the religious right movement, towards the end of his life, he said something, I'm paraphrasing, he said that, Although both sides wanted to deal with culture and politics, the left bore down on culture, the right bore down on elections. They both got what they wanted and the left won. And culture, uh, politics is downstream from culture. Now I'm, there's gonna, I'm gonna quibble with some of those things because in the pro-life movement, we um, have actually won. We've actually gained a lot of ground. And in some other culture area, we've gained a lot of ground, but you understand his meaning. All right, do we have time for another one? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, um, getting back to social media, uh, I know I realize they're private companies, and we should not break them up or, or, or do intensive regulation. Mark Zuckerberg said once that we're basically a utility, uh, and, and, and they need, that they should be providing a neutral open platform and they're not big tech. Is there other ways other than breaking up or, or strong regulation to maybe set them up as a, yeah, regulate them as a utility for, I believe Ted Cruz had another idea, uh, some community <coughs> law, I can't remember the name of right now. What, yeah. what other methods? Yeah, so um, <coughs> none that are good. None that are good. So. Let's say you regulate it as a utility and you begin to put it under more explicit government control. Um, so President Kamala Harris is going to be determining Facebook content and, and speech restrictions. Bad deal. That's a bad deal. What you have to understand, anytime you begin to put government in charge of speech, you never can presume you're going to control the government. I mean, this is, this is one of the funny things when I talk to some of my um, friends on the left and they're proposing these government interventions into the world of, of ideas and I say so uh, you're wanting Donald Trump and, and Attorney General Barr to govern your speech no 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 that's not what I mean so every time I hear of a government proposal to regulate a private entity to improve the climate of ideas I kind of involuntarily start to break out in hives because I know if there's one thing we can know about American politics is no party maintains control indefinitely. Um, and as far as what, what Cruz is saying, there's this provision in, uh, in federal law that essentially says if you're an internet, if there are certain kinds of internet companies that are considered public platforms and not publishers. In other words, um, if you are, if you're a publisher, you're, you're liable, you're responsible for the contents of your communication. You can sue National Review for libel if I say something that's maliciously false about another person. Not just me, you can sue National Review because we're a publisher. But you cannot sue a platform for libel. And 
a lot of people say, well, if, if Facebook is saying has community standards or it has rules or hate speech rules, it's no longer a platform, it's a publisher. Well, that is a bot, Pandora's box, we do not want to open. Because here's what happens if you say, so I think a publisher, a publisher is somebody whose content is subject to pre-publication editorial control. So we, I have an editor, and that editor helps safeguard me from making mistakes. So if I'm a publisher, I have pre-publication editorial control. The institution is responsible. If, we do, if you do not have pre-publication editorial control, you're doomed. You're just doomed. And it is not humanly possible to have pre-publication editorial control for Twitter. I mean, how many content moderators would have to, they'd have to hire a million, there'd be like a million people sitting in cubicles um, pre-approving tweets. Of course not, that's not gonna happen. So uh, it has long been understood, like if you create a comment board, for example, um, National Review isn't liable for the contents of the comment board, but we can use rules to delete posts after they've been posted. That doesn't make us a publisher. We're still a platform because you could you would open Pandora's box. Um, I think we're are we out of time? Yeah, we get one more. One more. Okay. Yes, sir. So it feels as if all my life, educators, teachers have been liberal, but when I was younger, they didn't talk politics in school. But it feels like in I'll say the last thirty years, there's way more of that. So they're they're you know they're influencing, they're brainwashing thinking of our kids, although in my case, two of my three have survived the brainwashing, but yeah. one has so <laughs> Do you feel directionally similar, and if so, how do we fight the... So I, here's what I think is happening, and it is mainly happening in, because if you look at the ideological breakdown by race and by class in this country, there is one segment of America <coughs> that is moving very quickly ideologically, and it is, it is upper middle class and rich white progressives, okay? This is not a top-down imposition or creation of, of educators on kids. This is a cooperative process of parents and teachers, parents choosing institutions very intentionally, teachers giving parents what they want in the education of their kids. It is creating a radicalizing effect. Um, David Brooks had an article uh, recently, he called, he called it Liberal Parents, Radical Children. And what their liberal parents have been doing is they've been choosing a path of education for their children that is designed from the get-go to be value-laden and very political in the same way that, for example, evangelical parents often choose, say, an evangelical school, especially on the coasts. One of the wildest things ever is talking to a parent, a progressive parent, about their, their school in the outskirts of San, Di uh, San Francisco and about the policies and the, and the um, teaching that they love. You know, it's the kind of place I was talking to one woman where um, she said, yeah, I had to do a written apology because I invited a speaker and uh, he handed out M&Ms and the families at this school will not tolerate any foods with artificial coloring. Mm. I was thinking, man, that's a little di different from my Tennessee public school where my son goes. So I told her this story uh, in my school, my son's school, uh, the kids started an underground boxing league, um, and it got so popular that there was a boxing card of 10 fights with a rapper performing at the midway point between the 10 fights, a local student rapper, and about 800 kids showed up for it at this farm out in the middle of Williamson County, Tennessee, and the police come flying in to shut it down. And they were gonna arrest people for assault, and every one of the kids who was boxing produced a parental permission slip. <laughs> so that's what I call a cultural difference. Uh, so we have, in this country, we have an education process that for a lot of these parents is yielding the desired result. Now that's not to say that there aren't conservative parents who are sending their kids to public schools in Georgia and Tennessee and aren't getting some progressive indoctrination, but it's not overwhelming. But what we're seeing in, on, in the coasts and many of the blue enclaves in the, in the heartland is there is an intentional educational effort to train children from very young age to be highly political. And we saw this, did you see when Diane Feinstein had a confrontation with kids in her office and she's sort of like, 
kids, you don't know what it's like to be a senator. And there will all be a senator. You know, she was sort of like, you kids get off my lawn. And all of conservative Twitter all of a sudden was like, why do I like Dianne Feinstein? <laughs> uh, but we have this cooperative effort, parents and educators, that is raising a radicalized generation. And what you're seeing is, if you look at almost every measure of belief and values, the increasing outlier is the white progressive community. It is, so there's this inherent tension in the Democratic Party right now. The two biggest church-going groups in the U.S. are white evangelical Protestants and black Democrats. Two biggest church-going groups in the U.S. What is the most secular group of people in the U.S.? White Democrats. So in the Democratic Party are the most secular and most religious segments of the American public. That's a huge cultural tension and it's one of relatively recent vintage. Right now, only about 30% of white Democrats believe in the God of the Bible. 70% do not. Wow. That's a huge cultural change. And so that creates a tension. And those, those uh, individuals who are by and large upper middle class, upper class, have created enclaves that are perpetuating and radicalizing. <coughs> They're perpetuating their values and radicalizing their children. And that's what we're seeing on campus. So I think that's it. So thank you all very much. I'll hang around for a little bit to answer questions, but I deeply appreciate your hospitality and having me here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That was uh, exactly the kind of message I knew we would get today and just so thoughtful and inspirational, and we appreciate it. Um, thank you to National Review Institute for your partnership on this. Um, we hope that those who came here through the Georgia Public Policy Foundation door will get to know National Review a little bit better and vice versa. And um, you know, lots going on uh, for both groups here in Atlanta. Um, thank you for coming today and we're adjourned.